Wake up. It's the Sleep Unplugged Podcast, episode 63, Sleep and Anxiety, Why Worry? Welcome, everyone, to the Sleep Unplugged Podcast. My name is Dr. Chris Winner. I'm a neurologist and sleep specialist and your host. If you're new to the Sleep Unplugged Podcast, welcome. Glad you're here. If you're a veteran of the podcast, welcome back. We're glad you're still with us. This is a first week, first Monday of the month podcast. So we'll be talking about a topic related to insomnia. We do that every month, the first Monday of any month, we talk about insomnia. And I think that sleep and anxiety is an excellent topic to cover because the two are so intricately meshed together. And the idea for the podcast came to me in sort of an unusual way, which we'll get to. So I hope that you'll find this podcast interesting, helpful, and sort of illuminating as it comes to individuals dealing with anxiety, dealing with insomnia, and the combinations between the two. So if you'd like to get in touch with the show, if you have ideas for future topics, if you'd like to communicate about this topic, uh, you can reach the show via our social media. It's Dr. Chris Winter Twitter, Dr. Chris Winter Instagram, Dr. Chris Winter Threads. We have a YouTube channel where we upload all the videos of the podcast, and you can find us on there and communicate with the show as well. Just to round things out, I've written two books: "The Sleep Solution: Why Your Sleep's Broken, How to Fix It," as well as "The Rested Child: Why You're Tired, Wired, Your Irritable Child May Have a Sleep Disorder and How to Help." Anxiety and talking about anxiety both as adults and kids is very front and center in both of those, in both of those books. Um, I think there it's a, like I said, extremely important topic and really looking forward to getting into it with you. So we always start the show off with a comment, correction, criticism, complaint, something starting with the letter C. And I got a really nice communication by, from Dr. Anders, Andrew Spector. Um, Andrew is the He's an associate professor at Duke University for his vice chair of inclusion, diversity, and empowerment, which we at the Sleep and Plug podcast believe in, that those positions are important and, des and deserve to be preserved. So we salute Andrew for fighting that good fight. But he's also the program director of the Sleep Medicine Fellowship at Duke University and associate program director for the neurology residency. So Andrew has got his hands full he is a busy academic sleep neurologist, great guy. I've met him on several occasions, the people that he takes care of down in Durham, North Carolina are in great hands. And he wrote the show and said, um, hey, Chris, I'm a bit behind. Just got through episode 55 of your podcast. Your alphabetical differential of fatigue was awesome. So he's referring back to our episode that we did not too long ago on the differences between sleepiness and fatigue. That was episode 55 that we recorded back in on July 10th. This is one more episode that goes on my list that I insist my patients listen to. Thank you for this. Well, thank you, Andrew. That is a ringing endorsement from somebody who knows a lot more sleep than I do. We really appreciate feeding back and want to give a shout out to all the good folks down at Duke University who are doing the work and taking care of sleep patients. We're all helping each other out. Andrew's helped me out on many occasions, given me ideas and his, the people he works with down there are delightful. And so just again, communicating with the show, having somebody from Duke University write that in is, is really meaningful to me. So thank you very much, Andrew. Appreciate it. Um, so we always start the show off with some sort of musical tribute. And I said that the idea for this show came from an unusual place. I also had, you know, there was a couple of big deaths in music uh, this past week. One of them was Jimmy Buffett. And I tried like hell to figure out a song related to anxiety related to Jimmy Buffett. But man, that is hard because Jimmy Buffett's sound and music and vibe was all about leaving anxiety behind, relaxing with a drink in your hand, feet in the sand, and really enjoying life. And Jimmy Buffett's probably done more for anxiety around the world 
than any podcast or therapy could ever do. I'm not the biggest Jimmy Buffett fan, but I have to admit that when you're on the beach and some Jimmy Buffett tune comes up, it feels right. Uh, two of my favorite songs, Trying to Reason with Hurricane Season, is particularly resonant with me because I spend some time living in Florida, uh, in the Sarasota area, and I have lived through in about the span of a year, two hurricanes, Ian in um, uh, our most recent hurricane, Adridia, um, that, that just came kind of through here and everything was fine. Um, the other song that has always resonated, re resonated with me was, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Adalia. I'm not saying Adridia, Adalia. The other song that's always resonated with me was A Pirate Looks at 40. Um, as a 50 year old, there's a lot of themes in that song that 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 resonate with me when you've kind of gotten to a certain place and whatever career you have and you look back. So we we miss Jimmy Buffett and salute him on the show. And if anybody can figure out a good sleep related song by Jimmy Buffett, we will put it on the Spotify playlist volume two in his honor. But the song title from this week's uh, podcast is Why Worry? That's a Dire Straits song off of their fifth studio album, Brothers in Arms, which was a massive record at the time, album at the time, nine times platinum. It was released back in 85. It was the, like I said, the, the group's fifth album. I was always a big fan of their, their third studio album, um, making moves. It's the one that had Tunnel of Love, Skate Away, Romeo and Juliet. I mean, I'm a huge Sultans of Swing fan that was off their debut album, but wow, Making Moves was massive. And then they come up with this album in 85 and it just kind of blew everything away. It was, I've talked to people in the music industry and they said, this is probably one of the best engineered and recorded albums of all time. In fact, it won the Grammy in 86 for that. And what was really special about this album was, was the really the first album and recording to embrace digital recording and really have its eye on the marketing of its CD and not its cassette or its album. And this was all uh, to do with Mark Knopfler. But recently, Jack Sony, who is a, you know, sort of a, a, high, a hired musician, was sort of the unofficial extra member of Dire Straits during the time they were recording Brothers in Arms and he recently passed away. And Why Worry is the last track on side A of the album. It's completely instrumental. And not only does the title Why Worry sort of lend itself to the topic we have today, but if you go on YouTube or any place where you can find that song, you know, look up YouTube, Why Worry, and then look in the comment section. It is remarkable how many people feel a sense of stillness, anxiety, relief, calm. This song is meaningful to a lot of people. I admit when I first got the album, you're listening to Walk of Life and Money for Nothing and So Far Away, all the big hits off that song. This was kind of a throwaway song for me. When that song came on, it was time to fast forward the tape and flip the flip the cassette. But as I've gotten older, this song is, is really meaningful to me. And it's just beautifully, beautifully recorded. So hats off to... Dire Straits. Um, we'll put Why Worry on the on the Spotify playlist. So sleep and anxiety. This this topic came to me recently because I we were sort of setting up some televisions in a place and you know getting all of our apps loaded on and I noticed that the Samsung TV had something called like Samsung. I think it was called Samsung TV. So you push the Samsung TV button. And it kind of took you to something that looked like a cable, you know, guide. So as I'm flipping through these channels, these are bizarre channels. Like one of the channels is just Walking Dead reruns. And another one is Price is Right. So literally 24 hours a day on this Samsung channel 1073, you can just watch episodes of The Price is Right and like old episodes. And as I flipped through, there was a Family Ties episode. And man, if you're of my generation, Thursday night was huge. It was family ties, cheers, night court, you know, all in a row, big, big shows. I loved family ties. 
And I just happened to flip it on uh, during an episode called How Do You Sleep? It was the uh, fourth season of Family Ties, episode 10, where Alex Keaton is having insomnia. And I literally turned it on at the very beginning of the episode and saw the whole thing. And it's interesting, How Do You Sleep references a John Lennon song off of Imagine. So John Lennon and a Plastic Ono band uh, in 1971 released the album Imagine. One of the songs on it was How Do You Sleep? And I'll just, just this quick sidebar, indulge me. The, the lyrics of the song, How Do You Sleep? How Do You Sleep at Night? You live with straights who tell you you was king. Now, these are straights like you know, rubes or people who are goody two shoes, not dire straits, which was a nautical term for difficult water, completely different spelling. Uh, the lyrics go on, jump when mama tells you anything. The only thing you done was yesterday since you've gone, you're just another day and all kinds of interesting beetle references there to yesterday and, and, and how you sleep. So interesting that Family Ties chose that as the title. And the, the whole episode starts off with this sort of, um, somniloquy that Alex is thinking in his head as he's trying to sleep. And I'll read a little bit of the script. It's fantastic because it's so illustrative. 3 a.m. in the morning. I can't believe this is happening again. Why can't I sleep? It's dark. I'm tired. I'm in bed. I've slept successfully in the past. Maybe these pajamas are defective. And you can cue the laugh track there. This is ridiculous. I've slept a total of a minute and a half in the last six nights. I got midterms coming up. I got papers to write. Got a million things to do. If I don't get to sleep soon, I'm going to be awake. All right. Okay. Don't panic. I can still get four hours. If I fall asleep right now, go. Okay. So far, so good. I'm falling asleep. Here I go. I'm on my way. Drifting, drifting. I'm gone. Now I'm back. I don't know who wrote this piece of dialogue, but wow, if you're a long time listener to the show, and if you've been listening to the first episodes of every month, it's like an endless list of the things we've talked about. Three o'clock in the morning. I can't believe this is happening again. You can feel that resentment. The next line, why can't I sleep? Everybody who listens to this podcast knows I hate that phrase because it's never true. Sure, Alex P. Keaton cannot sleep in this moment, but he's not losing his ability to sleep. I'm dark. I'm tired. Remember, tired, sleepy, two very different things, right? I'm in bed. I've slept successfully in the past. So he's rationalizing everything he's talking about. And if you're familiar with the show Family Ties, Alex was a type A go-getter sort of at odds with his older sister i think older sister um justine bateman was sort of the slacker dated nick you know really did, wasn't that academically gifted it's you know etc and, and alex was hard on himself driven always walked around with a briefcase wearing a suit um i've slept a total of a minute and a half in the last six nights so now we get that anxiety, sleep state misperception we've talked about in previous episodes. I got midterms coming up. I got papers to write, a million things to do. So now he is associating the inability to sleep with his ability to successfully do the things he needs to get done in his life. And I, I love the idea. Don't panic. There's fear, right? Fear and sleep. Don't panic. It's all right. It's okay. He's trying to convince himself of that. I've still got a few hours. I've got four hours. So I always call that sleep math. People wake up. Okay, it's three in the morning. They've got to be up at seven. So you start doing the math. Okay, it's three o'clock. I have to be up at seven. Even if I fall asleep right now, I can still get seven hours, four hours of sleep. Um, so I, I just think this was awesome. And not only is it great to watch how he's decompensating during the episode. He's stressed out. He's anxious. He's irritable. It is on his mind. Skippy is giving him ideas to help him sleep. His family's giving him ideas to help him sleep. And eventually the episode ends with the Meredith Baxter Bernie character, his mother, reading him, you know, bedtime stories like he did when he was a kid, which is just this fantastic ending. At one point, he's actually listening to the radio and a, an old little Milton song comes on called, um, 
uh, uh, Alone in Blue it was actually being played by Buddy Budson, but the original was a 54, you know, kind of blue standard. And it was just kind of great that the the late night radio talk show comes on and plays Alone in Blue, uh, the kind of in reference to what he's kind of dealing with. So if you haven't seen that episode, my guess is you could find it somewhere for free. I found it on my Samsung TV for free. So again, it's the How Do You Sleep episode, uh, season four, episode 10. It's a powerhouse performance. I mean, it really feels, you feel it. I mean, he's just so frustrated by it. So I love this topic of sleep and anxiety. It's not new. We've been talking about the relationships between sleep, anxiety for a long time. One of my favorite papers, there's a 1949 paper entitled Insomnia as Related to Anxiety and ambition. This was in the Journal of Experimental Psychology, I believe. Um, Weberg uh, was the author. And I think that paper lends itself wonderfully to this episode. If you were to you know, encapsulate the Michael J. Fox character in Family Ties with three words, I think ambitious would be one of them. Anxious, type A would be one of them. Driven would be one of them. And that really resonates with sleep providers like like me who truly do the insomnia work because we see a lot of these people so is alex keaton the character diagnosed with anxiety i, I don't know I, I don't remember that ever being the case i remember some really dramatic episodes of that show where he's in crisis over certain things um, there was a really good one i think if I'm remembering correctly, where Alex is talking to a therapist that you can't see and the whole set is black. It's just Alex with black behind him talking to this voice about his his sort of anxiety struggles. If I'm remembering that wrong, I'll correct it later on. Um, you know, try to stay away from the misinformation, disinformation as we talked about in a few episodes back. So when we think about sleep and the things that influence it. Well, we talk a lot about those on this podcast. And there was a study in, in 2022 called Sleep Quality, a Narrative Review on Nutrition, Stimulants, and Physical Activities, Important Factors. And in this study, or this, this review, they're kind of looking at and saying, well, what, what does influence the quality of sleep? Not only the quality of our sleep, but the way we perceive it. If you're, if you're asked at a dinner party, hey, are you a good sleeper? And you say yes, or you say no, what are the things that tend to influence that? Well, stimulant use can be a big one, this paper said. Um, use of electronic devices, your nutrition, your exercise, all things we've talked about. And I think outside of the electronic devices, which I'm still dragging my feet on, we've done episodes on all those things, I think. But then there's stress and anxiety. And they were separated. Stress and anxiety is, is two different things. And when we think about that, anxiety is huge. I mean, anxiety is the most common mental health problem worldwide. And I don't think it's really even that close. And when you look at epidemiological studies, people um, with insomnia, um, about 50% of them to some degree are struggling with their sleep. So if you're somebody who's been diagnosed with anxiety or everybody knows you're anxious and have struggles with anxiety, but you're not really being treated for it, there's a 50-50 chance that you're going to struggle with sleep as well too. And, and that makes sense because we look at the neurotransmitters involved in anxiety. You know, what, what is making you biochemically anxious when there's no reason to be? I'm not talking about anxiety because your house is truly on fire. I'm talking about your house isn't on fire. It's a lovely Labor Day Monday and you're only thing you've got to figure out is if you're going to grill hot dogs or hamburgers, but you still feel that internal anxiety, you know, what's going on there. And, and there's been a lot of studies looking at the neurotransmitters that are, that are involved in anxiety, the uh, adenosine, adenosinergic, you know, pathways and, and, and cortisol. And, and there's lots of things that, that sort of play into that role that everybody has dialed at different levels. And so when people talk about, what is, there, is anxiety genetic? There are certainly predispositions to, to, to being anxious that, that we're aware of. And, and again, you're listening, you're talking to somebody who's by no means a, a psychiatrist, I'm a neurologist, and by no means an expert in the, the diagnosis, 
diagnosis, diagnosing and treatment of, of anxiety, although we see it all the time in our clinic. You don't have a lot of sleep disorders. You don't have a lot of insomnia without the presence of anxiety. And so understanding that anxiety is not something that is purely situational, I think is really important. I mean, even in 2023, I see things all the time about, you know, interviews or TikTok videos about mind over matter. Well, sure, to some degree, yeah. I mean, there's certain breathing exercises and mindfulness techniques and making sure you're getting enough sleep and exercise and eating right that can help individuals move that anxiety needle, you know, left or right. But I think we have to understand too that like disorders that we would talk about with, you know, Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease or migraine, there are certain lifestyle modifications you can do to change your risk for developing those things or dealing with them once you have them. But to some extent, there is a genetic factor there that we can't really sidestep or get around. So, you know, when we think about anxiety and sleep, I think it's important to understand that those relationships are bi-directional. The easy relationship to understand is when you are anxious, you're going to have trouble sleeping most likely. And that, that makes a lot of sense. That's what we're dealing with a lot of times in a sleep clinic is that we need to dial down that anxiety and specifically the anxiety around sleep to get an individual in that space where sleep can happen a little bit easier. Again, sleep's always going to happen, but it can be very problematic when the individual has gotten into bed and now there's a tremendous performance anxiety performance anxiety that is happening. And, and Alex Keaton, it, that that performance is so classic for that. You know, he is the guy that controls everything. He's making straight A's. He's going to go to the best college. He's going to get the best internship. He's going to make gazillion dollars. He's got it all laid out. He is a controller. Even his bedroom is very neat. Got the picture of Nixon on the wall and um, Buck, uh, is it Buck? Who was the other picture he had on there? You know, anyway, so it's just a very orderly bedroom. He's in his Alex P. Keaton matching pajamas with matching robe. I mean, he is controlling things. And when you're that kind of controlling person, which a lot of patients with anxiety are, that, that gives them a sense of comfort, right? When things get out of control, there's something you're not able to control, that's when the sparks start to fly. But I think the relationship goes the other way too, that when we are not sleeping well, we do have more issues related to anxiety, probably related to anything related to our mental health. So I think that's an important thing too, as patients, as providers, that sure, I need to help you sort of ratchet down your anxiety about sleep through education, better practices, things you can do to understand your sleep better. But in the back of our minds, we always want to make sure that the sleep quality is good, right? So if you've got something wrong with your sleep, you've got sleep apnea, you've got you know, restless leg syndrome, periodic limb movement. So there's something going on with your sleep, a noisy bed partner, a dog that's waking you up at night. We'll say sleep apnea. That sleep apnea is probably influencing your anxiety the next day or your ability to control it. So we always want to make sure, it's kind of like with shift workers. There's not a lot I can do to make your shift work better in some ways. You got to go into work at 3 a.m. and you get off eight hours later, three days a week and the other, I mean, that's tough. But what I can do is make sure that when you come, we assess your sleep and I say to you, well, this schedule you're on is terrible, but wow, when you're able to sleep, your sleep looks amazing. You've got the sleep of a 20 year old, congratulations. Or, ugh, there's some things here wrong with your sleep. Let's correct them. And even though we're not fixing the shift work, we are improving the overall nature quality index or score of your sleep in an effort to keep you, you know, more healthy. And that bi-directional relationship with sleep was actually looked at in the 22, 2022 study in the um Journal of Psychiatric Research, where they basically were looking at causal relationships and associations between insomnia, short sleep, 
long sleep and anxiety. And the conclusion was that at the, at the end of the review, they found that insomnia really had a causal effect on anxiety more so than short sleep and long sleep. And it's interesting because in our episode last week, or the episode when we were talking about how much sleep do you need, I guess it wasn't last week, it was two weeks ago, that you know we talked about, well, getting too few hours could set you up for all kinds of bad health outcomes, but sleeping too much could as, as well too. It was really interesting in this study, the thing that really drove anxiety was not inadequate sleep, or sleeping too much, sleep inertia, sleep drunkenness, but really the symptom of insomnia was the thing that really seemed to drive the increased levels of anxiety in this study. And, and those things I think are really important. So identifying insomnia, treating it can have big impacts on the ability to, to, to manage anxiety. And this is something that I think the psychiatric community is really cued into. We get all kinds of refer. If you said, Chris, out of the next 10 patients, where are they coming from? I would say four of the 10 come from psychiatrists, three or four of the other 10, you know, coming from primary care and the other two just look me up on the internet. You know what I mean? Like they're just kind of referring themselves kind of thing. So I think that that community is really doing its work when it comes to sleep uh, in a positive way. So what do we do? I mean, you know, you're saying, look, Chris, I'm, 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 I've got anxiety. I, I struggle with my sleep. What is my pathway forward here? I think the pathway forward is very similar to what we've talked about in episodes before. It's, you know, looking at lifestyle modifications, sleep interventions, cognitive behavioral therapy. And I'm going to throw this out there, even though it's not a particularly personal belief of my own. I do think there is room or space for medications here. And this is something that we've debated. We had a talk in the past about uh, one of the episodes was, you know, is there a, is there a argument for sleeping pills? You know, I can't remember what episode that was, but we kind of went back and forth with it. My, my, my point has always been sure, but that was episode 50. Show me a sleeping pill that really does something, you know, Show me some great research on sleeping pills. But, you know, I think that in individuals who are in some sort of crisis situation or their anxiety levels and their neurotransmitters are such, and this was, a, a, a I think, a, a, an argument that Nicole Mims was making. She's our buddy um, down in Charlotte, or I guess up in Charlotte, if, if I'm in Florida at the time, um, was saying, look, you know, some of these people have got some biochemical stuff that's deep, 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 that's going to create treatment failures. And so we look at individuals, lifestyle, sleep intervention, cognitive behavioral therapy, about 30% of those individuals who are struggling with their sleep with high levels of anxiety are actually going to fail. They're going to fail those interventions. So what do we do with them? I, I think that trying a medication in those situations is, is reasonable. I'm not sure what it's doing. You know, if somebody comes back and says, well, yeah, you gave me a little bit of this new sleeping pill and now I wasn't sleeping at all. Now I sleep the entire night. Maybe it's doing something we don't understand. Maybe it's providing some anxiety relief that I think Nicole would say, well, now that's giving you the space and the attention to now start working on maybe a more permanent solution. You know what I mean? Like you've, you've, you've patched up the leaking boat. Okay, we don't have to worry about the boat sinking now. You know, the patient, okay, now I'm stabilized. I, my, my work's stable. You know, you get Alex Keaton, he's taking some, okay, now he's stabilized. And he's a smart person. He's an intellectual person. Now you can start working with, okay, well, let me tell you about insomnia, Alex, and we're going to walk you through it because you've never had any kind of problem with this before. And that's how you usually it is with insomnia. You were a great sleeper until you weren't. So, you know, what are some other things that might be useful? The only, I was going to throw one more thing out here because I want to keep the podcast relatively short. And that is the idea of transcranial magnetic stimulation. This was, this is a relatively new therapy. Um, it's been, I think, pretty effective as it comes to the treatment of refractory depression, anxiety, PTSD, um, I don't, I don't provide it. I, I don't know that much about it. Although it's interesting when I was an, when I was a medical student, I participated in a study on uh, 
TMS, TMR, trans, trans, TMS. And it was amazing. Like they put a probe to my head. I was awake. And as it started firing, depending on where it was on my skull, it was activating certain cortical areas of the brain. Like they were doing at one point, I started stuttering. You know, they moved it around in my visual area and I kept seeing the most electric blue that you can imagine out of kind of one visual field. It was incredible. Blue, blue, electric blue is a great sound and vision. David Bowie, like I always think about that transcranial magnetic stimulation. I remember them at the time saying, well, don't worry. This is all completely transient. There's no lasting effect here, research subject who's getting a Starbucks gift card for participating in this study. But it, and I remember the guy, you know, dropped it one time and it was started going off and, and and I couldn't speak. I literally was aphasic, aphasic, you know, trying to get a word out. I couldn't, couldn't do it. Um, so anyway, the transcranial magnet, magnetic stimulation has actually been shown to help with anxiety um, and, and, um, PTSD. So I, I think that when you look at these treatment refractory patients, the drugs don't work. The CBTI hasn't worked. We've tried this with their schedule, sleep consolidation. We've done everything. I think for some of these patients, we're going to have to start looking for sort of novel therapies. And this could very well, very well be one of them. There was a 2019 study looking at transcranial magnetic stimulation in anxiety and, and trauma, trauma related disorders. It was a kind of a meta analysis. They looked at 520 articles, 17 made the cut in terms of uh, the criteria. And the conclusion was the meta-analysis just that TMS could be an effective treatment for generalized anxiety disorder and PTSD, less so for specific phobias and panic disorder. There just wasn't enough information to say yes or no. So I, I think that for individuals who are out there really struggling with anxiety, struggling with their sleep, feel like I've read Chris's book, I've heard every podcast, nothing works. It's just not working. There may be some novel treatments out there for you to, to talk to your doctors about and find out more about if you're right for that kind of therapy and if it could help with alleviating the anxiety that you're feeling and lifting the blanket off of your sleep. So that's it. Sleep and anxiety done and dusted. If you have questions, comments, if you've got that Jimmy Buffett song that we need for the playlist, hit me up at Twitter, DR Chris Winter, Instagram, DR Chris Winter Threads, DR Chris Winter YouTube channel, Sleep Unplugged YouTube channel. Uh, love to hear from you, comments about the show. Please like, subscribe, review the show. We really appreciate reviews of our podcast. And that's it. If you're listening to this on uh, Labor Day Monday, I hope you have a nice, peaceful, relaxing day. I hope you slept well last night leading up to it. And until next week, sleep well.